and welcome to this first episode of On The Shelf. What on earth is this about? Well, um, as you can tell, I really love books. Books are wonderful things. I mean, you know, the more you read, the more you know. It's simple, isn't it? You know, um, the world of books opens up the world out there. We can travel to uh, to other countries, to other places. We can travel into people's minds and ideas. When you read a book, when you read the words, you're traveling into that person's mind, aren't you? And uh, you know, and I like to read some kind of books about um, places around the world, and I can travel in my mind to those places. I think books are absolutely uh, fabulous. I love documentaries as well, and I love uh, you know all manner of things, music and that kind of thing. So you know, it's a travel, it's a journey, isn't it? Um, into somebody's mind though those things are the same aren't they books are the same music's the same um you know uh, i was watching a documentary recently uh, where joan armor trading was talking about her um her uh, creation of songs and she was saying that you know she's not important what's important is she's a creator of songs and the people then listen to those songs and take meaning from them and it's the same with books it's the same with um uh, quality TV shows that we might watch, you know, quality films we might watch, we get taken on a journey and books are, books are just the same and I love books. So uh, one of the things that we've done, all of us I suppose, or many of us over the last few years, and I've done this a lot, is I've sat here in my study and uh, talked to people. Um, I've led seminars and lectures and had conversations with people and throughout that time, often, people's attention has been drawn um, to what's behind me rather than kind of what I'm saying. That maybe tells you more about what I'm saying. Um, so it's been drawn to what's going on behind me because they're kind of, and people have said, oh, I'd really love to kind of uh, have a look at your book collection. I'd really like to kind of just browse those shelves and see what you've got in your library of books. And actually I've got a much better camera now, which means that um, you can probably see what the titles are. Um, but going back to early lockdown, I was using the, the, ca the only camera that I had available to me when it was probably a bit blurred. So a number of people have said over time, it'd be really, it'd be really lovely to kind of see your books and know what books you've got, um, to have a browse through them. A few people have said that. And I thought, what a great idea for a little podcast type video cast kind of show, I suppose. Um, so that what I'll do, what I was going to do uh, is to just uh, grab, grab a, a wedge of books off the shelf. I've already done it for today. Grab a wedge of books off the shelf and just, I'm not going to kind of tell you what's in each one in any great depth. I'm, I'm going to just kind of um, explain maybe how I was drawn to the book, why I was drawn to the book. I, I write notes in my books and I underline stuff. Um, and uh, and I'll maybe so I've found some quotes with little post-it notes in ready for you. So I've just had a quick browse through them, found some found some um, quotes that I'll that I'll uh, tell you, and uh, that'll help you see what kind of the book's about. And I might I'll just try and say a little bit about why why I read that particular book, what was what drew me to it. But one of the interesting things is, okay, the first clutch of books I've grabbed, haven't read that one yet. I've only read some of that one, so I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you about what I've read and what I haven't read, because what's on your shelves that you haven't read is just as important as what you have read. Umberto Wigo, this is Umberto Wigo's idea, and Umberto Wigo says, your library should contain as much of what you do not know as your financial means allows you to put there. Indeed, the more you know, the larger the rows of unread books should be. Um, let us call this collection of unread books your anti-library. So the idea is, and it really works, there are some books on these shelves here that um, I've only read recently, but I maybe bought several years ago. But somebody must have said to me, that would be a great book for you to read, it'd be really helpful to you for whatever reason. I thought, right, I'll grab that, get it while, get it while I can, uh, pop it on the shelf, read it now, or I'll read it sometime. And there's some great discoveries on these shelves um, that I just come across like, oh yeah, I remember buying that. Uh, I'll read that now. Um, so what's on here, and I will tell you, honest, honestly, whether I've not read these books or not. And actually, there are sections of books where I haven't read any of them. So that'll be quite interesting. I might discover some things myself 
while I'm while I'm on this little journey of uh, of, of trawling through my, my books for your entertainment, um, if that's your thing. Um, so, but I think it's important. Why? Some people ask the question, well, why do you have all of these books? Because you can get them, you know, on a Kindle now. And some people like Kindles, some people, some people don't. I have books on a Kindle. Maybe I might have to do a Kindle series. What's on my Kindle? Um, I prefer the book, tangible book in my hand, because I think we should create things in physical spaces. Um, I also um, have a collection of vinyl because I think it's important to collect and um, create some sort of archive of, of, uh, of, of the music you love or the books you like to read in a physical space. The world has become far too, um, far too instant, you know? Uh, there's something about owning the album and playing the album and flipping the sides over, or even a CD, you know? Um, something about owning a physical copy and having it in your possession is a thing that's important to you. And it's the same, it's the same with, uh, with books, I feel. So anyway, without, without further ado, let's, let's have a look. Um, let's have a look at what I've got. So this is the first clutch of books. Um, they're not random in the sense of what happens with my books is, the ones that end up down this end are the ones that uh, I either want to read, because so I want them in my face, or I've been reading or I've read, or you know they're of some use to me on a daily basis, because a lot of these books I've got here are academic textbooks, and they're not really something that's meant to be read cover to cover, they're meant to be dipped into as and when you need them. So the, the, the stuff I use tends to gravitate its way down here, so it'll be interesting when we get to that end, you know, in, 2032 while well, I'm still doing this so I've grabbed I've grabbed a clutch of books and here they are and I'll, I'll put a I'll put it up at the end uh, what they all what they all are um, for you to see so uh, there they go they're all the wrong way around aren't they I'll fix that <laughs> um, so the first one is guide the boards the society of the spectacle um, the board d-e-b-o-r-d -E interesting book can't remember where I, well i'm guessing as to where i discovered this from i think i was watching an adam curtis documentary and i think he mentioned guide aboard in one of his um documentaries if you've not watched any adam curtis documentaries get them watched brilliant documentaries made by the bbc i think largely anyway this book written in i think uh, 1967 let me check that let me check that i think that's when it was written yeah, 1967, the year of my birth. So that always interested me as well. What were the people thinking when I was when I was born? So guide aboard. It says this the the, the thing from on the back, you know, on the, the text on the back from the New Yorker says the Debordian analysis of modern life resonates more deeply and darkly than perhaps even its creator thought possible. So this is one of those books, and there's a few on the shelves we'll come across where people writing in the in the 60s and maybe early 70s predicted where we're at now predicted the society that we now find ourselves in i'll give you a flavor of debord's book where are we at here we go you know it's out of context so you have to pick the bits out but I, I, i've written i've written down the side this with an exclamation mark you know like people do online automation which is both the most advanced sector of modern industry and the epitome of its practice obliges the commodity system to resolve the following contradiction. The technological developments that objectively tend to eliminate work must at the same time preserve labor as a commodity because labor is the only creator of commodities. Our labor, I suppose, yeah, well, that's what he means. The only way to prevent automation or any other less extreme method of increasing labor productivity from reducing society's total necess necessary labor time is to create new jobs. To this end, the reserve army, here we go, to this end, the reserve army of the unemployed is listed into the tertiary or service sector, reinforcing the troops responsible for distributing and glorifying the latest commodities at a time when increasingly extensive campaigns advertising are necessary to convince people to buy increasingly unnecessary commodities. People have to work in the service sector. Jobs created in that sector, what have we seen a rise of? Rise of the service sector. 
so that the rest of us, the people not in the service sector, can continue to be sold commodities, have these commodities glorified, so that we are convinced to buy things that we don't need. Guided Boards, the Society of the Spectacle. It's brilliant. It's quite a, th quite a thin book as well. 116 pages or thereabouts. Just an afternoon's read. This one, what it's doing next to that book is beyond me. I don't know how this happens. We moved house recently, so the books are a bit all over the place. Alan Watts, The Way of the Zen. The Way of Zen. The Way of the Zen. The Way of Zen. Alan Watts, spiritual guy. Uh, this is a book, talks about the origins of Buddhism, talks about the origins of Zen. I found this book very heavy going. In fact, I didn't read it all. Um, I dipped dipped out to some sections and went to the next section and had a bit of a read, but there was some really useful stuff in. Um, you know, I'm a bit of a spiritual inquirer, so there was some interesting stuff in that needed to be thought about. And, um, and here's one thing that I've pulled out. Only when you have no thing in your mind and no mind in things, are you vacant and spiritual, empty and marvelous. It's beautiful, isn't it? Only when you have no thing in your mind and no mind in things are you vacant and spiritual. Vacant, used in a positive way there. Vacant and spiritual, available, vacant and available, empty and marvelous. Alan, what's the waves there? Very good. I've got little, I've got corners turned over because that's kind of where I got to in the various sections. Uh, so, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, that's Alan Watts, The Way of Zen. I'm going to put a list up at the end. This here, Elite Capture. All I can do is, I, I, uh, I bought this book very recently um, because it's an area that I'm interested in, identity politics. I'm interested in the debate that's going on around that. And I liked what this book looked like was about. Not read it. Not read it yet. Not even tiptoed into it. Identity politics is everywhere. Polarizing discourse from the campaign trail to the media but the phrase bears little resemblance to the concept as first introduced by the radical black feminist uh, Combahee River Collective. While the collective articulated a political viewpoint from their own position to build solidarity across lines of difference, identity politics is now weaponized as a means of protecting ever narrower group interests. That sounds really interesting. This is published by uh, Pluto Press. And Pluto Press, I think, are an, um, an impressive small publishing house. Uh, they do some great books. In fact, all of their books live together um, on my shelves because they've got a series. So they're all this same kind of format and they're just lovely. They look lovely. So I've got these three, very quickly, these three. Tangled in Terror, Uprooting Islamophobia. I've only read 40 more pages of this. Uh, interesting um manzua khan i follow her on twitter she's a very interesting woman islamophobia is everywhere it's a narrative and history woven so deeply into our everyday lives that we don't even notice it behind the scenes it affects the most vulnerable at the border and in prisons despite this the conversation about islamophobia is relegated to slurs interesting so i have started reading that maybe more that later on maybe i need to revisit some of these um, Mask Off by J.J. Bowler, Masculinity Redefined, very interesting book, I've read this, here's a little quote for you again, Pluto Press, uh, let me have a look, feminism is actually beneficial to men, get away, feminism is actually beneficial to men as it seeks to heal men and remove the pressures that patriarchal society places on them, a lot of commentators have, have talked about that, um, Jordan Peterson talks about that, Jordan Peterson is an interesting man, for me, he's kind of moved to a place now in terms of his public presentation and his speaking that troubles me um, but there's some very good stuff that he's written and talked about in the past which is interesting he seems to have moved to quite a right-wing position uh, these days maybe that's the representation of in the media maybe that is him i don't know but he says that he says you know we need to think about this idea of patriarchy and we need to ac acknowledge maybe that actually the patriarchy doesn't um does does harm to men as well at times because they're at they're asked required to behave in particular ways um that 
they maybe aren't comfortable with. So I like that idea. Feminism is actually beneficial to men as it seeks to heal men and remove the pressures that the patriarchal society places on. Good book, very good book. Mask off, JJ Bowler. And uh, this one is just as good. Amelia Hogan, it's a great little publishing company. Great, great stuff. And the books are not that long, you know. Uh, it's 163 pages that, but the type's reasonably big. Um, so it doesn't take you long to read them. You, know, you can get through one easily in a week. Um, this is another good book, Lost in Work, Escaping Capitalism, if this is something that you're interested in. I'll read you this. The sociologist Richard Sennett terms, terms this lack of status and psychological fallout from it the hidden injuries of class. In a class society, he argues, here we go, in a class society, he argues, not everyone is given secure dignity in the eyes of others. This is because someone's class position is presented as the ultimate outcome of personal ability. So you're in the class that you're in because you are either able or not able. The higher the class you're in, you're in that class because you're more able. Um, this is because someone's class position is presented as the ultimate outcome of personal ability and because attempts to legitimize the self in that same society are likely to fail and therefore to reinforce the original anxiety. Even when someone travels upwards between classes, the lingering feeling of status anxiety, he argues, remains. Absolutely, 100%. Um, that's, uh, that's a whole thing about, uh, you know, imposter syndrome, definitely, without a doubt. And, uh, and then, then, we have, uh, then we have Candide, Candide by Voltaire, um, French satire, uh, published in uh, 1759, or so I'm told, or thereabouts. It's not clear. It's not clear when it was published. They're not sure, but that's that's the best guess. So Candide is the first, I suppose, philosophical text. Is it a philosophical text? Probably um, philosophical text that we that we come across. And there's lots of these on the shelves. Lots of them unread. This one has been read. It's a dead easy read. Um, and it's an interesting read. Um, it's about, you know, there's this, uh, there's this idea that um, everything happens for a reason. Um, you know, the, this kind of um, eternal optimism. Ah, you know, this disastrous thing has, um, uh, has uh, occurred. Uh, this disastrous thing has happened, but it's all for the best in the end. And um, Candide, Voltaire and Candide uh, pokes fun at that really and, and kind of says really do you know what I mean is that really what it's about so it tells the story tells the story um, of uh, the, 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 the main character kind of uh, having this life where just thing after thing happens that's just like kind of you know awful things chasing his uh, chasing uh, his uh, his um, a fiance, I believe. I can't remember. That's a long time since I read it. But chasing somebody around, and and things befall him all the time. Things befall him, and the the idea is that well, you know, it's all for the best. It'll all work out well in the end. And um, it's a it's a um, Leibnizian optimism is what it is, you know. So Leibniz um, was uh, renowned for his optimism. So uh, through Candide, Voltaire kind of pokes fun at this. And Voltaire comes to the conclusion that uh, we must cultivate our garden rather than everything is is all for the best. Um, that, that that's what he kind of says, you know. So it's an interesting little book, poking fun at that uh, that idea um, that we that you know sometimes things whatever happens in life, it's all for the best. So there you go. There's the there's the first clutch of books um, on the shelf. And uh, we'll see. If anybody watches this, I'll do another one. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Okay, take care, see you soon.